next time. Um, so I'm going to be talking about Bayesian data analysis for gravitational wave astrophysics, um, although the content is, there's not super amounts of actual physics in this, this is data analysis. Right? Um, I'll be make, mentioning, make, making mentions of gravitational wave aspects of this, but it should all be applicable to lots of different areas of, of, uh, of and data analysis rather than just gravitational waves. Um, let's get moving through here. So, this is just an overview of what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction and then get straight in to what I think is at the core of absolutely everything to do with science and life, actually, uh, Bayes theorem. Uh, then I'll talk about the power spectral density, how we define the power spectral density. Again, that's had lots of relevance for, for LIGO data analysis, but it's, it's hopefully delivered in a sort of general way. Um, and then uh, talk about optimal filtering, so that's in relation to how we actually do our searches for gravitational waves. Now the searches that we do are particularly non-Bayesian, so I'm going to get rid of that as quickly as I possibly can and move on to what I want to talk about, which is uh, Bayesian parameter estimation, Bayesian model selection, then a gravitational wave example of how you might manipulate uh, Bayes' theorem to try and get the kind of expressions you want to actually calculate. And at the very end, if I have time, uh, which I, I often don't because I, I ramble on a lot, uh, I'll talk about new methods, which is code for machine learning. Okay. So for people who came here to listen to me and talk about machine learning, you might have to talk to me afterwards or in the conference break if I don't get that done. So, I don't like to talk in front of people for three hours without telling you who I actually am. Uh, just very briefly, so my name is Chris Messenger. I'm currently at the University of Glasgow. I'm a lecturer at the University of Glasgow, and I have been there, been there since 2013. I went there on my second, no, no my fourth postdoc. I went there. Uh, I started out in uh, my my early childhood in North Wales. I went to university in the centre of Britain, in the University of Birmingham, 1997, uh, and then stayed on to my PhD and left there in 2005. And then went to Glasgow the first time to do a postdoc. I loved it so much uh, that I wanted to come back. All that time I, would do, I did my PhD on gravitational wave data analysis for continuous gravitational waves, the ones that come from rapidly spinning neutron stars. And I continued that and took that work to, to Glasgow. Did two years there, and then I came over to Germany, not too far from here, to work at the AEI in Hanover, and did three years there in Bruce Allen's group, uh, when he used to be in my home. And continued my work on, on continuous gravitational waves and then got a bit bored of it because we haven't found any. Uh, moved to Cardiff and switched to doing CBCs, uh, working in the Cardiff group with Sath Sathya Prakash and others, and then came back to Glasgow. And I continued doing things like uh, cosmology with co compact binary coalescence uh, detections of gravitational waves, and a bit of multi messenger astronomy, and sticking with some of the continuous waves and now machine learning stuff to try and find gravitational waves in our net. So that's a little bit about me. And then this is just a little bit about today. Um, yeah, before I start, please ask questions at any time. As, hey. Um, uh, please ask any, any questions uh, at any time. I may not know the answer because I've heard some of the questions you've been asking the other lecturers uh, and you, you seem to know your stuff. So please try and challenge me if something's not clear. Uh, this is a big statistics lecture, three hours long statistics, which on paper, that doesn't sound very uh, good, right? that sounds quite dry. I'm going to try and keep it as light as possible. Um, there will be an interactive part in the second half with actually physically throwing things through. So if you find it boring in the first half, please come back to the second half at least to play the game. Um, I, am, I was going to be writing on the board, but Frank has kindly lent me his, uh, his tablet thing to write on here, so I'll be writing up there. I'm new to it, please bear with me. Let me know if it's just not legible or anything like that. Um, I'm basing everything that I'm going to go through on lecture notes that I wrote up, and they're on the website, on the Theros website, so if you want to go on your phone to your laptop to get the notes out in front of you now, that will probably help you. Uh, otherwise, you're just going to have to stick with me, but they are available. And they are full of mistakes because I wrote it this last week, so you, you, it's your job to find it yourself. Um, and I leave tomorrow very early in the morning
along. So if you have any questions, ask them during the lecture, in the coffee break, or after or this evening. Uh, but after that, you have to be through email. Okay? So, oh no, is that the introduction? So, we will start with, uh, with base theory. This is at the core of everything I do, and I actually base a lot of my life decisions around Bayes' theory. As soon as you get into Bayes, you start to have this different attitude about probabilities and how, how you should do things, uh, and how things happen around you. There it is, Reverend Thomas Bayes, 1701 to 1761, uh, a religious man, but we won't go into that. Uh, he came up with that theorem, which is so basic, but so powerful. Uh, the probability of a thing A, given the, uh, uh, the state of B, is just equal to that thing on the right, the probability of B, given the state of A, times the probability of A being in this state, <coughs> all divided by the probability of B. Right? And it's quite amazing how much you can do with that. It's a very simple formula, but we're going to try and uh, do lots of things with that today. Now that's the next slide. So that's my cue to split to the handwritten notes. So let me, I apologize for the clunkiness of this. Let's go through that. Uh, Frank's on hand to help me with his tablet, if need be. And then coffee with the carries.
as a general rule, anything on the left hand side now, we'll go in a minute, we'll go on to a continuous regime, this is discrete variables, where A, a and B are having specific values, uh, but we'll go on to a, a continuous case later, and that sum turns into an integral. So, what we'll say now is, this probability of B because of this statement here, then you find, for the normalization to be correct, for both sides of this, then the sum on the right hand side also has to equal 1. And if the sum on the left hand side is equal to 1, then I can write, I'm sorry about this, I'm going to learn how to use this tablet better, the 1 on the left hand side is now going to equal uh, the sum over all states on here, P with B given A, slightly slower than running the board, but I'm getting there, divided by P of B. But P of B on its own has got no dependency on A at all, so I can take it out the front and you can take it onto the left hand side. So if I cross it out, bring up a menu bar for some reason, and uh, put this over here as turn this into a B. <laughs> terms are actually labelled, they have specific names in Bayes' theory, but I'll do that when we get to the continuous case. So next, Frank told me how to get to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, I'll speed up, don't worry. Right, uh, next thing is, is an example, uh, a very basic example, just to get you warmed up, where we want to find out a specific case, it's quite close to my heart, but if you, you've got the notes in front of you, it's a story about somebody called Francis who is getting married in Scotland in the summer, and that is my fiance and we're getting married in the summer in Scotland outside. So this is a weather-based uh, uh, probability example. So let me just read out here. Imagine Francis is getting married tomorrow at an outdoor ceremony in Scotland. In recent years it has rained only 200 days of the year, which is actually the average for Scotland. Uh, and so we will state that P of A, I'll write this down as I'm reading, Where's the pen on? <laughs> so, P of A, in this case, is going to be equal to 200 over 365. They're not 266, that's 200. Right? So, A in this case uh, represents the state of raining tomorrow. Right? Uh, therefore, we can straight away say that the only other state, it's either raining tomorrow or it's not raining tomorrow, would be P of not A which I'm going to put a little bar over the top to say not A, and that's going to be equal to 165 over 365. Everybody happy with that? We're all starting very, very fast. Um, unfortunately, the weather report has predicted rain for tomorrow. When it actually rains, the weather report correctly forecasts rain 90% of the time, and hence we're able to assign probability of B given A equals 0 0.9. So in this case, probability of B given A, so this is, B is the state of predicting rain. So the probability of predicting rain, given that there is rain tomorrow, is 0 0.9. When it doesn't rain, they incorrectly forecast rain 10% of the time. So probability of B given not A is equal to zero point. And so we can put all of this together and construct what we actually want. What we want is the probability of A given B. Something has happened, we want to update our information. We have P of A is 200 over 365, but we have some more information. So let's put it all together. And you can use Bayes' theorem and you would end up with P of A given B is going to be equal to P of B given A times the prior, well the probability of A, I'll define what these things are later, what their names are, divided by this uh, normalization factor, uh, as was stated on the previous thing, hopefully you have the notes, that's just the sum over all possible states. 
which we wrote down on the previous slide, sorry, it, I'll write it out what, what it should be. It's going to be P of B given A times the probability of A plus the probability of A of B given not A times the probability of not A. So if you put all of these things together, you'll have to trust me that you end up, unfortunately for me and Francis, it's a 0 0.92, which is a 92% chance of it raining tomorrow. Unfortunately, we're not getting married tomorrow. Uh, but you can see how the, this is not particularly, the example that this is taken from online has slightly different numbers, but I changed them for Scotland. The fact that the, uh, it rains 200 time, uh, days a year already gives you most of the information. Uh, compared to what uh, the weather forecast is saying. So it, it updates your information to give you slightly more confidence it will <coughs> So that is our little basic discrete example of how you might manipulate some of these probabilities. Let's go on to continuous variables. It's a very simple uh, change. To go on to the continuous variables. Whereas before I tried to, my handwriting's not so good, using capital P's to represent actual probabilities. Now I'm going to use lowercase p's to represent probability densities. Try this. So in this case, we start exactly the same way as before, but it will be a lowercase p of, and I'm going to change my variables because they're more in line with what I want to talk about later, of theta <coughs> and x. d theta dx. Now that's a probability, a joint probability density. I'm going to use these terms. Please stop me from using terms that I haven't defined. A joint meaning and, the probability of something and something simultaneously. So this is the probability of theta and x, but that's a density. So to make it into a probability, I have to multiply it by a tiny little bit of delta theta and a tiny little bit of delta x. So that's what I've done. So that left hand side is now totally a probability. But I can do the same thing as I did before and write this in reverse. dx and theta. Straight away the dx and d thetas cancel. And we expand these just as we did before. And I'll get it right this time. I'm going to pay attention. And that's p of x, yes. That's p of x given theta. p of theta. And then we get Bayes' theorem back, but this time we find on the continuous variable space, I'm getting smoother than this. X. Right. So things to note at this point, we'll start labeling these individual components of what these things are, because this is the sort of most useful form of Bayes' theorem. There we go. So let me get a laser pointer and talk about some of these things. So, there's four components to this thing. Oh, I'm moving away from the mic. I'll stay, I'll stay there, Mike. There's four components to this thing. The left hand side. I'll leave that till the end. That's the most important thing. We arrange this equation specifically to have that thing on the left-hand side because that's what we want to compute. It's made up of things on the right-hand side. The first term is called the likelihood. It is the probability of me measuring x given theta, and it becomes the likelihood when x is the data, when x represents your actual measured data. Right? Theta are your parameters of a particular problem that you have. So the probability, this is the probability density of measuring my certain set of data given a set of parameters. Ah, oh, I missed the, there's supposed to be a bracket there, obviously. This thing without the, with the missing bracket is just P of theta, not dependent on anything else. It's just the probability distribution of the parameters theta. It is what you believe before you started this entire endeavor. It's called your priors. It's a very easy mistake to make to start manipulating your priors based on what you're currently doing with your experiments. You have to be hold strong and not mess with your priors. Your priors are what you really believe about your, your parameters of the model you're looking at before you did anything. Right? This will become a bit more clear when we get do some more examples. The denominator here is called the Bayesian evidence or the marginal likelihood. Um, 
We're going to use this heavily in the model selection section because this encapsulates uh, the, the um, it, it quantifies a number that says how good your mod, your data fit your model. Right? It's the sort of equivalent of a chi-square test, but far, far better. So now we move over on to the left-hand side. This is the known as the posterior probability distribution. This is probability of your parameters of your model given your measured data. This is what you do your experiment to try and find out. Right? Things to stress, especially on the left-hand side, this is a probability distribution. And as far as I'm concerned, when I do an experiment, and say I'm doing some gravitational wave experiment, and we, we try and do the Hubble constant measurement with compact binary coalescences, standard sirens, I would want this to be P of H0 given gravitational wave data. Right? I'm not interested particularly in a specific value of the Hubble constant. I'm not that interested in the mean, the mode, uh, the median, the confidence intervals we'll talk about. I'm interested in that as a probability distribution because that encapsulates all the information I can extract out of my data through the likelihood coupled with what I knew about the Hubble constant before. And this is another sort of way of looking at this, that to get your current set of information that you believe right now, it's the product of what you've just learned from your experiment multiplied by what you believed beforehand. And this is a very iterative process. If I measure the Hubble constant, for example, today with some data, I'll use a prior. Hopefully, I will use the prior from yesterday's measurement of the Hubble constant. If there wasn't a yesterday's version, I have to find some other prior belief on the Hubble constant, on that prior. But then tomorrow, when I make a new measurement, I can use today's posterior as my prior. And you can see how this is just constant updating of information to try and fine tune and hone your information, your, your estimate, by putting together lots and lots of uh, experimental evidence. And I think that's probably all I wanted to say about that part. Oh, finally, of this section, uh, two final things. So, if you embark on an experiment and you want to do some Bayesian data analysis, you need lots of things, but I like to boil it down to you need three things before you can even start writing stuff down on a piece of paper. You need to know a signal model. You need to have a model for what you expect to be in the data with noise added on top of it, right? And in this case, you can think of compact binary coalescence signals, which are the lovely waveforms you can show uh, countless times, right? The lovely, smooth, noise-free, GR-computed waveforms. You need a model, and you need to know how that model is dictated to by the physical parameters of interest, <coughs> and the physical parameters of no interest, right? But it's determined by some parameters, masses, sky positions, inclinations, polarization angles, all that kind of stuff. <coughs> Once you have that in hand, uh, you're a third of the way there. Next thing you need is a noise model. You need to understand your detector noise because that comes in here. The likelihood function. You're asking, what's the probability of my be measuring my noisy data given this particular set of parameters that I'm going to use? You can only say that if you have an understanding of the noise behavior of your detector. And the final thing you need is whilst you have a model and you know it's determined by these parameters, you need to know these priors on the parameters. What did I believe before I came to work today? Right? Uh, for example, with masses and for its compact binary coalescences, the sky is quite easy. And this is a good example, actually. This is another example of me rambling on, so I won't finish. But imagine you have a detector. We all know the detectors, we've been told this week, the detectors have certain antenna patterns that are sensitive in certain directions at certain times of the day. Should I then change my prior on the sky position, given I know my detector is more sensitive over there right now? That's a question. You can guess what my toe is. Yes. No, you should not. It's got nothing to do with your detector. It's your prior belief on where these sources were in the universe. Right? So my prior belief is I have no idea. Well, I'm going to assume a, a sort of isotropic homogeneous universe these sources are going to be anywhere, equally likely in any direction. So I will not modify my prior, right, based on data I have not yet even measured. 
So with sky, it's dead easy, right? It's uniform in right ascension, and it's uniform in cosine of inclination. But things like masses, you have to decide on a prior distribution for the masses of binary black holes, because you can't avoid it in a Bayesian analysis. You have to choose something, otherwise you can't get a posterior, right? So just be aware of that. This is probably the only time I'll mention frequentist analysis. Frequentists don't have priors explicitly, but they have it implicitly. <coughs> so here, Bayesian people are just being upfront with saying, my result, my posterior, is based on my understanding of the data and my signal, and my prior beliefs on the parameters that I'm trying to uh, estimate. If you have very weak, here's an, and another example is the sky position. If you have a very weak prior in your sky position, meaning I don't know where it is anywhere on, on the, the sky, but I make a measurement of gravitational wave detection and I find out where it is on the sky. We already know our localization is tens to hundreds of degrees. That's quite a strong piece of information you're getting from your light. It dominates the weak information you have from your prior. So you can have situations where the prior doesn't really matter that much because you were quite you were quite unsure about where the parameter was, but the data is telling you it's definitely there. You can have vice versa. You can have a very strong prior, for example, the Hubble constant. We could take the cosmic microwave background value of the Hubble constant and then take our quite weak measurement for gravitational waves. In that case, the prior dominates us at the moment. Hence, we have the cosmic microwave background prior to make our result look good. Finally, we have the Bayesian evidence, which is just the normalization term. No, actually, we talked about that. I was telling you what three things you need. I told you the three things you need. Yes? Right, that's a very good question. The priors on noise fall into the category of, of well, they fall into the category of your noise model. You have to assume a certain distribution of your noise. Are you, re are you referring to this denominator term? So, one thing to note here, um, for parameter estimation, you see this is just a constant. This top term depends on theta. And this left-hand side depends on theta. This thing is just a number. So if you want to find out the values of certain parameters in your posterior, you don't need this denominator term. And in fact, when we do parameter estimation, we're going to ignore it. But uh, the other answer to that question is, our, under our information about what we believe about the noise is in here. I will add one more thing. If you have if your noise is not known brilliantly and it depends itself on some parameters that you don't know, you can incorporate those into theta. So for example, if you don't know the variance of your noise, I can say, well, that's one of my unknown parameters in theta. And I can put it in the prior as well. All right? Okay. Definitely going to go Next is, uh, well, I'll just write one more thing on here. Ah, perfect time. Everyone, no, it's okay. Um, for the purpose of everything we do with gravitational wave, but this is not the case in all situations, it's in the case in most situations, that the data that you measure, which in our case is x, we're going to write as a signal plus noise. This is called additive noise. You can imagine situations where the data that you're measuring is actually multiplied by some noise in your instrument. But for us, this is going to be additive, and that's going to determine how we do our, our likelihoods. But just bear in mind, you can have various different things. Uh, and these might be in indexed as a sort of discrete sampling. These are J's, where J is indexing time. So this would be every time sample in the, in the detector noise is, in the detector <coughs> output, is the signal plus some instance of noise at that time. Or this could be in the frequency domain. For the little tilde, turning into a Fourier transform. Both are, they're all equivalent, and we'll talk about mostly frequency domain for a very good reason in a second. So, next, Gaussian likelihood. Next. So, in general, everybody assumes Gaussian noise. It works really, really well. Unless you have a very good reason not to assume Gaussian noise, uh, you should assume Gaussian noise. We're going to assume Gaussian noise. Everybody in LIGO assumes Gaussian noise. We are simultaneously played with non-Gaussianities, but for purposes of parameter estimation, 
the stick of gas here. So let's write down the probability distribution of measuring a vector of noise, just noise on its own. And this is a vector, I'll try and make it, that's, yeah, it doesn't mean not n, it means a vector of n now. In general, this is square root 2 pi determinant of C. C is the covariance matrix, exponential, minus a half, n vector, C, make covariance matrix to the minus 1, vector transposed. So in general, that's the definition of a multivariate Gaussian distribution where n is your vector of noisy data and c is the covariance matrix that determines the both variance of your individual components and how they are correlated with each other in your data stream. So n, n is just this vector of n0 C uh, is going to be an n by n matrix. Now, for example, uh, an example of this might be pulsar timing data, where the time of arrival of pulses from every single pulsar in a pulsar timing array is actually correlated because they're all passing through the same stochastic background of gravitational waves when they reach the Earth. Fortunately, we don't have to deal with that because computing that likelihood involves inverting a very large matrix. You don't really want that situation. So what we're going to show in a little bit is that the covariance matrix is diagonal. And in nearly all cases, especially if you're working in the frequency domain with LIGO data, the P of n ends up being, let me write this, product n minus 1, k 0,
if my model is true, if everything I've assumed is true, then X is made up of some signal plus some noise. The signal is deterministic, it's not random in nature, but X is, ra X is random because the noise is random. So what's the probability of me measuring uh, X? Well, it's the same as the probability of me measuring X minus S, because that's the noise. And I can write that down. And if you write down exactly the same formula as we had before and drop all of the p factor, I'm going to drop that and I'll say why I can later on. This is going to be exponential minus a half, sum n minus 1, j equals 0, xj minus sj theta vector, all squared. Stats, you'll notice that this thing in the exponential looks quite familiar, and that's just the chi squared. So you can write this as proportional, I should say proportional, of e to the minus chi squared over 2. In fact, let's delete that. Chi squared of theta. So just to write it in a slightly more familiar way if you're all familiar with, with chi-squares. Chi-square just being the weighted sum of the difference between your data and your model. In this case, governed by our parameters f theta and our choice of model. So what did I say? Did I say I was going to do power spectrum as well in the first 45 minutes? That's looking unlike. No, I didn't. I said I would, uh, I would do it in the next four minutes. So that's kind of doing all right. We did some arguments. So are there any questions at this point before I move on to the next stage? All, all straightforward? Yeah? Haven't said anything totally outlandish? Good. Oh, yes, two. I oh. said before that even in the case of non version analysis, we should assume. No. Sorry, I may have said that, I don't mean that. Um, so, for things like combat binary coalescences, the, the, sorry, LIGO, so I'm going to focus on gravitational waves. So, so for LIGO and Virgo detectors and, and the other gravitational wave detectors, they are, the non gaussianities that are problematic are these transient glitch-like events. Unfortunately, they look like transient astrophysical events, and we have techniques to get rid of those. But if you're lucky, and most of the time we are lucky, and I'll give you one example where we weren't, that the data, your, the signals arrive in between those glitches. And I think you all know, as we were shown this week, and if you didn't know already, that the binary neutron star uh, 17, no wait, 17, I keep forgetting all the numbers of these, uh, it had a massive glitch right in the middle of it, right? And so that was a problem. So you can't assume Gaussian noise there. You can do something super fancy with that analysis. But you could just do what people did, which was just cut out that bit of data. Um, right, well let me get, give me a second to sort of get set up on the next bit. Two Virgo, the two Hanford, uh, two LIGO detectors, and the one Virgo detector. 
I can't remember, I think this is 2017 sensitivity. Again, this lecture is not about the astrophysics, it's about the fact that we have uh, this data and the fact that it's not a flat line across here. There is different amounts of noise power, different amounts of noise shaking out of our interferometer output hole when there are no gravitational wave signals, and you get different amounts of different frequencies. This is our sweet spot, it's oscillating the least at around 200 hertz. You have a lot, an order of magnitude and a half more oscillations at low frequencies and half an order of magnitude at high frequencies. <coughs> so, in that last expression that we have on the board where we have the sigma j squared and the likelihood underneath, that is going to be this, right? Each of these terms is the, well, the amount here that's uh, where this curve is, is representing the amount of noise. So we need to have that in our denominator in our line. So I will switch back. Sorry, this is only one little brief picture to distract you from the point right on the other board. Please bear, remember that in your mind. So in this case, we're taking a small set, a, a finite amount of time, but we're taking that limit of that finite amount of time to infinity, and we're just doing the integral of the data with respect to time, right? And that should give you the expectation value of x. You're just taking the average of the data. We're going to assume that we have a process with zero mean, which is kind of standard in gravitational waves. Uh, and we will define the power in the time series as a very similar quantity, x squared, the average of the squared value of the data coming out of the data, which again is the limit t tending to infinity, 1 over t, integral minus t over 2, t over 2, x squared. Then we're going to make use of a thing called Parseval's theorem. Am I going to spell it right? Which says that there is the amount of power equal n. The amount of power represented in the frequency domain and the time domain should be equivalent because there's nothing intrinsically different between representing something in the time and the frequency domain. So the integral, that Parseval's theorem is just that the modulus of the time domain version. No, I'll do that. Square dt minus infinity to infinity is equal to the same thing in frequency. Dn. So we can write, we can replace in the previous expression, we can switch it around for the frequency domain, the limit. T to infinity. Uh, 
um, we get a factor of 2 because we're going to take the integral from 0 to infinity instead of minus infinity to infinity because our time series is real. So if our time series is real, all the negative frequencies are just the complex conjugates of the, the positive frequencies. And because we're squaring and mod squaring anyway, you're just getting the same amount of negative and positive. So I'll just integrate the positive frequencies and, and multiply by it. So here, x of n, x tilde of n, uh, mod or square df, which we will then claim is this thing called x of f df. Right, this is our first representation or first mention of s, the capital <coughs> s, which is the power spectral density. I should say clearly though, I'll show that plot again later. What I showed you was not the power spectral density, it's the square root of it. Whenever you see those curves with 10 to the minus 20s on them, that's the amplitude spectral density, which is the square root of the power spectral density. So with that, you can rewrite, with that definition, you can then just straight away rewrite what S of F is. And there are different ways to define it, but they all end up being the same. S of F is this limit as t tends to infinity 2 2 over t mod integral t over 2 minus t over 2 x of t t to the minus 2 Before we had, we didn't explicitly write, we wrote x tilde of f. Now I'm just writing what the definition of the Fourier transform is. This integral is my definition of the Fourier transform of x. So, this is the most mathematical bit of the whole of the three hours. So, we can take this and we can expand it. Just keep going. T tends to, I'm going to get annoyed right now, then T tends to infinity. T over 2. So I'm just going to write these integrals as two separate integrals now. T over 2 minus T over 2. X of T. My handwriting is going to be 2 pi i of T. dt. Multiply by another integral. But it's going to be a complex conjugate. going to be a little variable t prime e to the minus 2 pi not minus sorry because it's complex conjugate e to the 2 pi i f prime t prime dt prime is it just one f though? thank you this is going to be annoying did it? which you can then introduce to the minus 2 pi 
I have tall d tall. Because this thing here on the right hand side is bracket, which I forgot to put bracket around. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, that is known as the autocorrelation function. That's the definition of it. Another definition of the autocorrelation function, r of tall, r of tall is equal to the annual bracket average of x of t x of t plus tall. There we go. So, remember the left hand side, this is S of F, this is our power spectral density. So just getting to this final result, the power spectral density is twice the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation. So that's another definition. How uh, about the, the uh, introduction in this left integral? How about the this x of t yes. and which one, sorry, which bit? Uh, this one? No, no, previous. Next one? Yes. Oh, yeah, maybe that's it. Because you
because no one ever does anything in the continuous domain. Everybody deals with computers, and the stuff that comes out of our gravitational wave detectors come out at 16,000 times a second, which is near continuous, but it's still every 16,000th of a second. So what I like to do, and I've done this in the notes, is, is write these in the discrete form. So if you use the definitions of the Fourier transform on the first page of this, where we've got the definition of the continuous domain and the discrete domain, then you find that you can approximate the power spectral density in the k frequency beam as 2 over t, that's the normalization factor that was elusive to me as a, as a uh, postgraduate. Hold up, delete, delete, delete. That gets a subscript k because we're in the discrete domain. So that's just the equivalent of this missing out the delta function because we're just going to assume there's never any correlation between different frequencies. So this is related to the power spectral density in the discrete domain. Expression 
uh, as written in the previous slide, but now I'm writing the real part 